So when we were together last, we were talking about beams and bending, and we applied a moment to a beam uh, there to recap what we had uh, talked about that uh, caused this beam to, to curve up, if you will. And we talked about these uh, fibers up here being in uh, compression and getting shorter. We talked about the fibers down here being in tension and getting longer. Of course, as you transition from compression to tension, there must be one point where they don't get shorter and they don't get longer, and that was the, the neutral axes. Uh, and that notion of them not getting longer and shorter, we can actually sum up that the strain on the neutral axes is equal to zero. So that's, uh, I don't know that we said it in, in such terms, but the strain in the neutral axes, by definition, has to be equal to zero because it's not getting longer or shorter. And remember that uh, strain, epsilon, is equal to delta over L. So if delta, the change in dimension, is equal to zero, the strain would have to be equal to zero. And then, of course, we looked at the uh, cross section of this, and we know that the neutral axes coincided with the centroid. Um, that's why we're interested in finding the centroid and also interested in finding the area moment of inertia about that centroid. And we looked at the uh, compression in the top of this and the tension in the bottom of that. So that's kind of where we were and where I'd like to, uh, to pick up. What I'd like to do now is maybe think about cutting a section out of here and looking at it in a, a bit more detail. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to draw that uh, section that I've sliced out of there and uh, see how we do with this. And I'm going to uh, look at the uh, distances here. I'm going to say that this is the neutral axis. And I'm going to talk about the distance from the neutral axis to the um, radius of curvature. No, that's not very good at all. I do a little better with that. Yeah, that'll be okay now. So this distance here I'm going to define as rho, the radius of curvature. That's from this uh, point of curvature to the, uh, the neutral axis. And um, this distance here from the neutral axis to let's say the top of the beam or the bottom of the beam for that matter but I'm going to show it to the top of the beam I'm going to say that that's y so I could talk about then this distance here being equal to the radius of curvature rho minus the distance y hopefully that uh, appears fairly straightforward and I'm going to talk about this angle in here I'm going to say that this uh, goes through some angle I will say uh, d theta Okay. So if I want to talk about epsilon x in this case, I could say that uh, epsilon x in the axial direction, so we'll come back and we'll say that this is epsilon x. We'll talk about x in the, uh, we can say that this is the x direction. So if we talk about epsilon x, we could say that that's the change in length over the original length. Okay, it goes back to our general equation that we had up there. And we could then say that this was equal to, if I look at the top, if I talk about a point on the top of this thing, it's going to get shorter, right? So it's going to be a negative number, so I could say it's minus because it's getting shorter. And I could talk about um, rho times d theta. That's the arc length at the neutral axis. It's going to remain constant, right? That's essentially this, this distance across this neutral axis. And then if I subtract this uh, distance rho minus y times d theta. What that gives us is how much this thing shortens. Because rho minus y times d theta, that's the distance of the top. So if I take this neutral axis distance and subtract the distance of the top, that gives me how much that shrinks. And I'm going to put that as a negative. Then I'll divide this by the original length, which is, of course, rho times d theta. If I uh, go to solve this, maybe I should uh, reiterate this is epsilon x. So solving for epsilon x, everything has a d theta in it, and I get to cancel that out. I've got a um, rho minus a rho, and then I have a minus y. 
let's see, a minus, that's a minus, so I have a minus there and a minus there and a minus outside, so I really end up with three minuses, which would give me a minus, so I'll minus y divided by rho, the radius of curvature. Now, remember Hooke's Law, if we talk about general equations, Hooke's Law up here that stress, stress sigma is equal to Young's modulus E times the strain epsilon. So I could extend the strain into stress. I could talk about normal stress. I could say that the normal stress, sigma, or sigma x in this case, is equal to minus E times the strain, which would be y divided by the radius of curvature rho. This is normal stress due to bending. Now that's not a particularly nice or useful equation. I mean, it's a good equation and we're going to use it uh, further on down the line in the derivation. But the radius of curvature rho is something that's kind of hard to find. I mean, you imagine walking into this room and you load up the beams in the floor. And they sag probably just a little bit. I don't want to offend anyone, but they probably sag just a little bit. Okay, they're sagging up here too. And somewhere way, way up in the sky, hundreds if not thousands of feet up there would be this point. And I don't want to have to try and uh, measure that, so I want to uh, use some other quantities. So let's um, step away from this a little bit. Uh, I guess as an aside, if we were to look at the uh, cross section of this thing, So section, the section before, let's say that it had a square rectangular cross section, it's probably going to look like that. If we then look at it after, it's probably going to look something more like that if I exaggerate it. So we could talk about um, epsilon z maybe as uh, minus Poisson's ratio times epsilon x that we just found, or epsilon y being equal to minus Poisson's ratio times epsilon x. So we do have some strain in the transverse directions, um, but I'm, I'm going to pretty much leave it at that. I, I would like to come back and try and develop this more and work on this, though. So let me separate this off. We'll come back to this. <coughs> But let's look at this in a little different way. So if I look at this uh, beam here, and it has this uh, neutral axis here, and we've applied some moment to it, a little bit like uh, sectioning off this, this portion of the, the picture there. We even talked about a little bit about this last time. We would probably have some compression here, and we would have some tension there. And if I look at a, a section of this, maybe I'll uh, take that beam as uh, something more generic and look at the the y direction here. And maybe I could put this, I can show this moment here as a uh, torque. So that's that double-headed arrow there with the torque. And maybe I'll put a differential element there that I call uh, dA. So if I want to talk about the moment due to this area dA or the stress on that area dA, I could say that I have dM is equal to the stress. We're going to have some stress here, sigma. We could call that sigma x, sigma x times dA, because if you have stress times area, you get force, right? And then I need to multiply it by the distance y. This is, of course, the distance y. So I'd have sigma x dA times the, the distance y. And if I look at the, the direction uh, that this is going, these, these would both be in the same direction. So if they're on the opposite side of the equal sign, this would have to be negative. So if I do some substitution here, I could then say that dm is equal to, bring the negative sign over, I'll have minus, and then do I have an expression for sigma x? Yeah, that's what I worked with over here. I'm going to go ahead and use that, minus Young's modulus times y over the radius of curvature. So I'll have minus Young's modulus times y divided by the radius of curvature. 
So that's sigma, and then I still have the dA, and then I have the y. And if I wanted to find the, uh, the moment, I could just uh, sum up all of the dm's. So I could say that m is equal to the integral of dm, which would be equal to the integral. The negative signs cancel, and I have the integral of E Young's modulus over rho, the radius of curvature, times y squared dA, right? And I could say then that this is Young's modulus and the radius of curvature should be constant. I can bring those out. So I'll take those outside of the integral. And I have the integral of y squared dA. Have you seen the integral of y squared dA before? That's I, isn't it? The polar, or the, not the polar moment of inertia, but the area moment of inertia. So I can say then that this is equal to E times I divided by the radius of curvature rho. That's what the moment there is equal to. Well, again, I get an equation with uh, rho in it, but maybe I can work these together. So let's go back to the, the uh, one that I started with, this one here. And uh, let me jot that down so we have it handy. Sigma x is equal to minus e times y divided by rho. And if I rearrange this one, I could say from this one, using this one down here, that um, m over i is equal to what? m over i is going to be equal to e divided by rho. Yeah, which is going to be equal to, let's see, and which is going to be equal then to minus sigma x divided by y. So if I solve this thing for the moment, I can say that the moment m is equal to minus sigma x times i divided by y, which is kind of nice because now I have this relationship and I don't have that radius of curvature that is oftentimes difficult to deal with. Now I'm probably not interested in solving for the moment. I'd like to solve for the stress. So solving for the stress, I get that uh, sigma, or sigma x, is equal to minus m y divided by i. And that's our equation that we want. This is for uh, bending stress. So that's a normal stress due to bending. We have the moment we get from the moment diagram. We have y, which is the distance from the neutral axis to where we're trying to find the uh, stress. And we have i, the area moment of inertia. Maybe I should uh, note these on here. This is the uh, distance from the neutral axis to the point we're looking at. And of course I is the area moment of inertia. Okay. Well let's see, if we look at the uh, units on this, maybe we should check the uh, units real quick before we start using this thing. I don't have to worry about the negative sign with the units. M will probably be uh, pound, and oddly enough, we're going to want it in pound inches to get things to work out. So we're going to have to be pretty careful about, with that. Normally, we would have it probably in uh, pound feet, but I want it in pound inches. Y is probably going to be in inches, and of course, I would be in inches to the fourth. When you cancel these two with a couple of those, you get pounds per inch squared, or PSI. So as long as we've got our moment in pound inches, which is not real common. We'll have to make that conversion or multiply by 12. Uh, we should come out okay with our units. Well, with this, and this, this is a, a huge per portion of our beam. The other part is shear, and we'll get to shear eventually. But for now, I'd like to work some problems dealing with bending stress, normal stress due to bending. So I'm going to start out with a problem here. And... Um, we're going to take a, a beam that's 11 feet long. It's got a 3-foot cantilever at the left-hand side and then an 8-foot uh, 
normal span. It has a constant distributed load of 100 pounds per foot. And I could find the reactions, and I'm not trying to shortchange this process, but just to keep this moving along. Uh, if you found the reactions, you would find this uh, left-hand reaction at uh, 7,562 and a half pounds, and the right hand at uh, 3437 and a half pounds. Okay, and I've got too many significant figures there, but I, I kept that half pound so that I didn't get a lot of round off on my shear and moment diagram, so I could try and convince you that I make it back to, to zero. Now I'm going to say that the uh, section is this 2 by 6 and a 2 by 10. We actually saw that in the last lecture, or, or maybe it was the, the lecture before the last one. But we've had that section. I think the uh, summary of that is on the internet and whatnot. Um, and we found that the centroid was 7.25 inches from this uh, bottom in finding a centroid. We calculated the area moment inertia as 441 inches to the fourth. We did that a couple different ways, so hopefully you're comfortable with that. If this whole thing is 10 plus 2, that'd be 12 inches tall. That would mean that this is, what, 4.75 inches from the top. So I selected this one because we'd done this before and hopefully have a pretty good understanding of that. Well, I'm going to quickly go through the uh, shear diagram here. If you look at the shear diagram, we're going to start at the left-hand side at 0, and I'm going to um, transition down, right? So I'm going to drop down, and 3 times 100 would take me to, let's see, actually my numbers are not right. Let's see, i got got 100, this would be 1,000 pounds per foot, wouldn't it? There we go. So I'll make sure that's correct. Not 100 pounds per foot, but 1,000 pounds per foot. That's the only way our reactions will be right. So that would take me to 3,000 down here. That would take me to 3,000 down there. And then what am I going to do? I have to jump up, don't I? So I jump up by that value of 7,562.5. So that takes me to 4,562. Point five, and then at that point I start out, start back down again, don't I? I'm gonna end up about here, and I would uh, at this point take this uh, four thousand five hundred sixty-two point five, and I would subtract eight thousand from it, so that's going to put me at minus three thousand four hundred thirty-seven point five, which incidentally I get to jump back up and I get to zero. Okay. This uh, going forward, this point here is going to be interesting on the moment diagram. So I want to try and find where that is. I'm going to go ahead and take that distance as x, and then this distance will be eight minus x. So I can say that x is to forty-five sixty-two point five, as eight minus x is to thirty-four thirty-seven point five. And when you solve for x in that case, it comes out as 4.5625. I got way too many significant figures, but if you don't keep it in the memory of your calculator, right there is where you'll probably get some pretty significant round off. Okay, then with that, I should be prepared to uh, tackle the moment, which will be in pound feet. So I start at zero. I have this uh, negative area there, so that means I'm going to have second order down like that. I find the area under there, 3,000 times 3 divided by 2, which puts me at what? Minus 4,500. And then I'm going to come back up. I find the area under there, so that will take me back up to this point here, which is... 5,908.2. And again, I have way too many significant figures here, but so you can confirm this uh, get, or get some confirmation <coughs> if you go through it on your own. And then this should have the exact same value and should be able to take me back to zero. So that was a quick run through, but we've done that many times uh, before on your shear and moment diagram. If you're struggling with that, here's one more example to sit down with on a clean piece of paper and see if you can make it through. It's a good, good solid example to look at. What I'd like to do is really get into the beam part now, and I would like to come up with the maximum compressive stress. So I'd like to find 
the maximum compressive stress. Okay, the maximum compressive stress due to bending. So we're going to go back and we're going to use our equation sigma is equal to minus my divided by i, right? We just got done going through that. We've got i, we've got m, we should be able to do this. So I'm going to look at a couple points. I think um, this point right here jumps out at me. That is a large value for m, isn't it? 5908.2. So why don't I try the... Um, Try the uh, top of the beam right there, which is, let's see, if x is 4.5, so I'm going to try the uh, top of the beam. At x equals, let's see, if I start at the left-hand side and x is going uh, this way, I have to take 3 and add it to the x I calculated there, so I'm going to have 7.5625. Feet. So you all know where I am? I'm looking at a point at the top of the beam right there. I should have quite a bit of compressive stress there, right? So let's see what that uh, turns out to be. Sigma is equal to minus, I have a negative sign, and then our moment is what? 5908.2. And the one thing that I'm going to have to do, this is in terms of, maybe I should put my units here since we're going through it for the first time. This is pound feet. And then I need to find y. If I'm looking at the top of the beam, what's y? Right there. So that's going to be 4.75 inches, right? And then I'm going to divide by I. We had I as 441 inches to the fourth. And again, I'm not trying to shortchange the calculation of I, but I want to get through these problems in a reasonable amount of time. So we'll use an I that we had before. It, it's a correct I. If you sit down with this uh, this evening for practice or something and, and go through that, you, you will get that same answer. Now, I've got a units problem here. I need to multiply this by 12 inches in a foot, so I can get rid of this foot, and no, I didn't do that unit right, did I? You're all too courteous. So this should be what? Maybe you were trying to stop me, and I didn't notice. This is 5902. I should just read my own writing. Pound feet. Okay. So then I get to cancel this foot with that foot. And I have pounds in the numerator. I have inches, so I can cancel those two with those, and I'll come up with pounds per inch squared, PSI, which is what I'm looking for. And this is here. Just why I couldn't make a big deal about this, and you know, I'm not going to say it's good that I made a mistake, but uh, um, you know, it gives us a little more emphasis on this here. If you don't do this, your answer is going to be too small by what? 12, right? which no one has a factor of safety at 12. It's going to fail. So be very careful with this. We've seen lots of people make mistakes here, and this can be uh, devastating. So uh, be careful with the units. You run through this, and you come up with a negative. That leading negative sign gives you a sigma equal minus 764 PSI. OK, that seems like a final answer. But there's another one creeping around here that I'm kind of interested in. I like that one. And you might say, well, the moment's not as high, 4,500, so why would you even mess around with it? Well, I think Y is going to change things. So let me talk now about the bottom of the beam. <coughs> let me look at the bottom of the beam at X equals what? 3. You see where I am? I'm right here now. So if I go through that, I could say that sigma is equal to minus, and what's our moment? Minus 4,500, and what's y? Well, there's minus y, isn't it? Minus 7.25. I still have the 12 there for the units, and I still have the same i, 441. 
So as far as negative signs go, I end up with what? There's three of them, so I end up with a negative sign. You run through the math on this then, and you come up with 888 PSI. So this is the winner. So your maximum compressive stress doesn't necessarily occur where you have the maximum moment. Now this will only be a problem if you have an unsymmetrical section. Obviously if this was a symmetrical section and you had the, the uh, y that was above the same as the y below, it would be obvious you'd take the maximum answer, right? I mean that is to say that if, if this looked like this and it was symmetrical, you had your neutral axes there, would you worry about this one? Not at all. Okay. Yes? Well, I had to switch from the top to the bottom so that I could get this negative y in here. Right here. And I wanted to, the, the bottom was further away, so that was that larger value. So if it's symmetrical, you don't have to switch. You're just going to take your largest moment and run with it. Questions with that? Yes? Well, this is the neutral axis, and by definition, I take what's above the neutral axis as positive, and what's below the neutral axis is negative. Other questions? I like questions like this because it's relatively easy and shows you whether you understand the concept or not. So, I want to practice these. Yes? Uh, so, I would have done like the top and the positive. Like, you would have done the negative 45 hundred and the positive 475 and you would have gotten the signal Yes. Yeah, I was I was looking for answers where I came up with a negative value for sigma. I wanted to find a large negative value for sigma. And these are the two uh, spots that, that come up the the largest negative. It's kind of the battle between those. Other questions? Yes? Yes. I should, maybe not all of them, but some of the, the more obvious ones. Do, would I want to check this one right here? No, probably not. But uh, these two guys really intrigue me since it's non symmetrical. Other questions? Good. Well, a lot of times when we do beam design, we're not necessarily looking for the stress. And this is uh, one of these things in terms of the kind of the philosophy of your education. We talk about uh, sigma being equal to minus m y over i. Okay, and this would be thought of as analysis. Okay, so you got analysis, and pretty soon this is uh, so you're going to spend a couple years doing this. And then you're going to transition at about the junior level into design. Because here you're answering the question, what is sigma? And most of the time in design, we don't care. Okay, We're given sigma. We're given that you're going to use steel, and it has a certain sigma. We're given that you're going to use wood, and it has a certain sigma. What we would like to do is try and find the size. So now, if we're trying to find the size of this thing, if we're given the load, and the load dictates what the moment is, and we're given the sigma, then we're trying to find y and i. And as you change the size of the beam, if you go with a taller beam, put a little more there and a little more there, uh, i increases, but what's y do? y increases too, doesn't it? So now you've got two things changing, and it can be problematic. So in design, a lot of times, we're going to say that the section modulus, let me make sure I get the right terminology for this. We're going to say our section modulus. Our section modulus S is equal to I divided by Y. Okay. So then if I go over here, I can say that sigma is equal to, and I'm going to drop the negative sign for a little while, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a little bit, but uh, I've got m 
And then if s is equal to i over y, I could say that that's equal to s, isn't it? So if I solve for s, I could say that that's equal to m divided by the stress sigma. So now with s, I can start to figure out what size of beam I need to buy, right? m is going to be dictated by the load, sigma by the material I buy, and I take those values and I figure out s, and s is going to tell me how much beam, how big a beam I need to get. And this is design, okay? So that's the transition you're going to be going through in the next year or so. You don't do so much analysis. You start to do design, and you answer an entirely different set of questions. Now, as far as the section modulus goes, we use this for symmetrical sections. Symmetrical section. So a rectangular section is uh, great. A square section is great. We can do a uh, I section. That's fine as long as the top's the same as the bottom. Things we don't want to uh, see would be a, a T section. We're going to have to go back and, and use this. Um, maybe an I section where it's not uh, the same. Okay, probably don't want that. But if we have symmetrical sections, which we have a lot of, the majority of our, our sections do use that. We can use the section modulus and use it quite well. And my, my negative sign, I lost the negative sign because we tend not to worry too much about that at this point because we're actually looking at not only the stress at the top, but we're looking at the stress at the bottom, and then we just assign whether it's tension or compression. Okay, so with that, we can start to do some really quick design. Let's see. How much time? We've got a few minutes here. So let's say that you want to uh, build a, uh, a garage or a man cave or whatever you want to call it. Okay, and this is our plan view. And we'd like a uh, door. So maybe we'll have a 16-foot door. And uh, how, how deep would we like the uh, man cave? 40 feet. Yeah, 40 feet's good because then we can put uh, two... Uh, two cars in there back to back, right? Okay, so, yeah. Okay, that's good. So if we, if I look at taking a, a section on this thing, so our section's gonna be like uh, this, we'll probably have a, a back wall, we've got uh, some slab here, thickened foundation section. And then the, I guess I want to move my section, don't I? There we go. You can stagger your sections. There we go. Okay. So with that section, I'll have a beam here that's supporting the uh, roof. And we'll say that the uh, roof looks like this. We're not going to put an eaves on it. We're going to keep it really easy like that where this is 40 feet and we're going to say that this is a standard roof around here so you're looking at about uh, 40 pounds per square foot between your snow load and your dead load if it's a comp roof like that so if I were to come up with a model for this beam what's that model going to look like well I'm going to have a beam that looks like this, supported over here, simply supported. It's going to have a 16-foot span. You might say, well, it has to be a little longer or less than that. It depends on your, your the door, whether it's a commercial door or residential door. And how much is the load that we have here? Well, it has to hold up half the roof, right? I mean, this half is going to go in to, to go to the back wall. This is going to go to the front. So it's holding up 20 feet of roof, isn't it? So this ends up being uh, 40 times 20. This is then 800 pounds per foot, isn't it? Because it's holding up 
20, 20 feet at 40 pounds per square foot. So you have 40 pounds per square foot times 20 feet gives me 800 pounds per foot. All right, so then I can go with a uh, moment diagram here. Well, the shear diagram would look something like this, right? A little more symmetrical than that. That's the uh, shear. The moment diagram is going to look something like that. Remember, we did this many times. What is the maximum value for a simply supported beam? WL squared divided by 8. You remember that number? Okay. So we've got that our moment is W times L squared over 8. So I have 800 times the uh, length squared. So 16 squared divided by 8. Let's see what that turns out to be. So I have uh, 25,600 pound feet. Anyone else get that number? Yeah. Okay. And now I'm going to do something kind of strange. I'm going to multiply this by uh, 12 and come up with uh, 307,000. 200 pound inches because I'd like it in pound inches. And let's see, we're going to do this out of saw lumber. It's probably going to be a pretty good sized beam. Probably we'll have to go with a glue lamb, but let's say that maybe a friend works at a mill or something. They're going to set up the saws for us and they'll cut some stuff we don't normally get, some great big timbers that are pretty uncommon nowadays. Used to be very common, but fairly uncommon nowadays. So we're going to use saw lumber. And we're going to say that sigma max is a thousand psi. And you structural folks that go into civil, you'll call that sigma or f sub b uh, for bending, but it's your it's your bending stress. So if I go back and look at the equation that we we have developed, what was that equation? That's your section modulus s is equal to the moment divided by your stress sigma. So I can figure out what section modulus I need, which is going to be what. The moment, 307, 200 pound inches divided by 1,000 PSI, which gives me what? 307.2 inches cubed. Well, we said that this S was equal to I divided by Y, didn't we? So if I look at a rectangular section that has some base B and a height H, I is equal to what? Base times height cubed over 12. We saw that. And what's Y equal to? Well, there's your most extreme Y at the top or the bottom. So I'll take this and I'll divide by what? A Y value of H over 2. So S turns out to be what? Base times height squared divided by 6. Is that right? And we should have inches cubed on this thing, right? So that's good. So I can set this thing equal to, so I now say that 307.2 inches cubed is equal to, let's say that we use a, uh, it's going to take a big beam, so we'll start out with an 8 by, which is going to be kind of a problem, we can't put that in a 2 by 6 wall very well, but we'll uh, pick up on this problem uh, and do some more on it, but uh, let's say it's an 8 by, so that'll give me 7 and a half, so 7.5 for the base inches, and I'd like to uh, solve for the height and I got to divide this by 6. So from this, what does the height turn out to be equal to? So 
So it looks like, uh, what, 15.6, which would be real close to a uh, 8 by 16. It's not going to quite be an 8 by 16. We'd have to go uh, technically because we'd be a 15 and a half with an 8 by 16. Um, so we may have to go with an 8 by 18, right? But it's real close to an 8 by 16. So this is the design process. This is probably what you're going to do a lot more than, than finding uh, sigma. I mean, you go through this plan and uh, given what the beam size is and find sigma, that's usually something in a forensics nature, trying to back out and figure out why it failed. Uh, but you do this a lot more. You do design where you're given what the loads are, you're given what the uh, stress is, and you want to try and figure out how big a beam the client customer has to buy. So we'll, we've got more here. We haven't included the weight of the beam. Maybe we want to look at some glue lamps. Maybe we want to look at some steel. We'll talk about that when we get together next time. Take care until then.